Hi everyone, in this video we are going to discuss molecular vibrations, but in order to do that we absolutely have to review the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's start off all the way over in the, in the left side with what we're going to consider high energy, so that means they're going to have short wavelengths. So we're going to start off by talking about our gamma radiation, and then a little bit lower energy would be our x-rays, then we have our ultraviolet, then we have our visible, then we have our IR or our infrared, then we have our microwaves, and then we have our radio waves. So our radio waves would then be the ones with the lowest energy and the long wavelengths. So we've talked about UV radiation before, and we know that when UV radiation hits a molecule, it dissociates the bonds within the molecule. We've also kind of discussed microwaves, not really, but we've kind of talked about them. And essentially what microwaves do is when they hit a molecule, they rotate the molecule. So in our food, when we put food in a microwave, we have microwaves that hit our food, which actually just causes our water molecules to spin or rotate, and that rotation actually just causes friction within the food, and that's what warms our food. So kind of neat, right? All right, so now what we're really going to talk about today, though, is what happens when infrared radiation hits a molecule, and it turns out that it causes the molecule to vibrate. So before we take go, or go any further into this, I want to ask a quick question make sure we're all on the same page. So so does IR radiation have higher or lower wavelengths than, and we're going to compare it to UV, go. All right, did we get an answer? Hopefully we did. We just needed to identify the fact that IR is in lower energy than UV. So if IR is lower energy than UV, then it must have a higher wavelength. And so we absolutely have to keep this clear in our mind because when IR radiation hits a molecule, it will not break a bond. It does not have enough energy to do that. All it's going to do is hit a molecule and cause it to vibrate. And so what we're going to do now is talk about what actually happens and how that works and how it vibrates. But in order to do that, I want to have a very good definition for you so that you can understand exactly how this process works. So let's start off with this. Molecules vibrate when the energy of the incident IR radiation, so just the IR that's coming in, matches its, so the molecule, vibrational energy. Okay, that's the technical definition. It's very complicated, but I need you to understand that and kind of think about it and try to break it apart. Essentially, what that means is that molecules vibrate at unique, okay, that's the important part, IR radiation. So just because a molecule is hit with IR radiation does not mean anything's going to happen because IR is this giant spectrum. It has a wide range of wavelengths. And so depending on the wavelength of the incoming energy, the incoming IR radiation, depends on whether or not that molecule is going to vibrate. And it is unique for every single molecule and every single type of bond. And so we're going to work through an example with carbon dioxide first. So we know at this point that carbon dioxide is CO2 we could draw it out, okay, make sure we have our lone pairs. I then would make sure that you could identify the geometry, so we would look at that and say that's definitely linear, and linear molecules all have a 180 degrees for bond angle. So at this point, I 100% you expect 100% expect you to be able to do all of that, that full analysis. All right, so now what we want to do is talk about what happens when IR radiation hits this molecule. So I'm using the ball and spring model here. My carbon is in the center, that's the one that's dark, and then the oxygens are on the outside. And we're going to try to figure out what happens when IR hits a bond of carbon dioxide. So two main things can happen, at least for this course, is you're either going to stretch or going to bend. So we're going to say stretching requires the most energy. 
So what I want you to do right now is just think about holding a slinky in your hand or a big spring. So it is definitely going to take the most amount of energy to pull that spring apart or to pull that slinky apart. Whereas if we just try to bend it and kind of move it around a, lot, a little bit like this, it does not take much energy at all. So just keep that in mind and you, this will hopefully be clear. All right, so let's draw out two different molecules because there's two different versions of stretches that we can do for CO2. Again, we're using the spring method because we're talking about what happens when the energy hits that bond specifically. Okay, so the first thing that can happen is we can have a symmetric stretch. So that means one oxygen pulls to the right and one oxygen pulls to the left. So picture your oxygens for carbon dioxide out here. They're just pulling in the opposite direction. That's it. This is considered a symmetrical stretch. The opposite thing could happen on this one, the other one. So what we can have is an oxygen going to the inside. We can have the carbon coming back at it and then we can have the other oxygen still going to the right. Okay, so this would be considered an asymmetrical stretch. And so what we have to do now is look at these arrows or vectors and see if there was a net change. Because if there was a net change, that means the electron cloud, or so just all the electrons that are hovering above and below that molecule, that is distorted. So if the electron cloud gets distorted, that means our vectors can't do not cancel each other out. So let's look at this first one here and kind of work through an example. So we're saying we have one vector going to the right and one vector going to the left. So we're gonna draw the first one here so we're going to say it's going to the right now we start at the new location and come back to the left these cancel each other out and so maybe you can just visually see that if you pull one this way and one this way they cancel each other out we're going to assume they have the same strength and the same distance so this would be no net change which really means no electron cloud distortion. Now that is super, super important because what that means is no IR absorbed. So when a stretch like this happens or anything like this happens and the vectors cancel each other out and there's no net change, that means there's no electron cloud distortion, which means no IR is absorbed. So let's look at our other example here. So what we see is two going to the right and one going to the left. So we can see two is stronger than one. There's definitely going to be a net change, but let's draw it out just to make sure we're sure here. So we're gonna start the ones going to the right, new location, come back to the left. Now another one goes to the right and so we come back, we're at a brand new location. So this is a new location we have moved there definitely is a net change so that means we have an electron cloud distortion and what that means is that IR radiation will be absorbed here super important all right so now let's move forward and talk about what happens with a bend so for number two the other option could be that we have a bend so this is something that requires less energy it's much much easier to do Okay, so now if a bend has less energy, we can draw this out the same way as before. We have two examples. So our oxygen connected to the springs, the carbon, back to another oxygen. Okay, so now a bend is kind of easy to visualize for one of these and difficult for the other. So we're going to start with the easy one. So we're just going to say these two go up and this one goes down. So that's pretty easy. If this is my carbon dioxide molecule, my oxygens go up, my carbon goes down, easy. Now, for the other one, we draw them at an angle, like this. And this one's going in the opposite direction. But now, I'm not saying they're going to the side. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the oxygens are going into the page. So if here are my oxygens, they're going at you. They're going into the page. Whereas the carbon sitting right here is coming out of the page. It's coming at me. So in your mind, you need to think into the page, out of the page. So these diagrams show four different directions. All right, so let's talk through these. The first bend, okay, where we're going up and down here, we see that two are going up, one is going down, two is greater than one. There's definitely a net change. And so that means we have an electron cloud distortion which means we have IR being absorbed. So that's a good thing. Now we can look at the other one here. Into the page, out of the page, two is greater than one. There's definitely a net change. We definitely have an electron cloud distortion, which means we definitely have IR absorption. All right, I know that's a lot, but let's just make sure we all understood that, okay? How many carbon dioxide vibrations, okay? Uh, create, we'll say, new charge distributions. So think about that, what, what that means. I haven't really explained that, but I want you to kind of think about this. See if you can apply it. Go. 
All right, did you get an answer? Hopefully you did. And so all you had to do was look back up for the three or the four drawings that we had before and to see which one of these had an electron cloud distortion. So an electron cloud distortion just means you're going to have a new charge distribution. So really all I was saying was how many of these are going to actually absorb IR radiation? And the answer was three. So let's talk about how we actually measure this in lab or experimentally. So essentially what you do is you have a sample. So in here we would have our carbon dioxide, we would place it in here, and then we would hit it with our infrared radiation. So we just hit our sample. And so essentially what happens is all of these wavelengths, so this is, remember IR is a big range, so we're shooting it with just tons of different levels of energy through the whole different spectrum of different wavelengths. And so they're all going through for the most part. And so you have your sample is here, your IR radiation is coming in, and it shoots through at one spot, and then almost every single wavelength goes through here all of them except for three because we just saw that there are three different ways that that molecule carbon dioxide can absorb the IR radiation. So all of these are going to go through or so it's going to be transmitted where we're going to have three different wavelengths that are going to be absorbed. So hopefully that makes sense. And so we measure that with a detector at the end. And so essentially, this detector is just sitting here trying to figure out which wavelengths do not hit it. And so if the wavelength doesn't hit it, the energy of a certain wave, if it doesn't hit it, then we know that that molecule absorbed that specific radiation. So it's really cool. So let's look at an actual spectrum. So this is a carbon dioxide IR spectrum. So it's a little messy. So let's kind of get ourselves familiar with this graph. So essentially what we have, okay, is we have our wave numbers at the bottom. So wave number is kind of a unique unit, but it's just one over centimeters, okay? So it's similar to wavelength, but not exactly. And then on this side, we have our transmittance, Okay, so we're trying to figure out how much goes through. Usually this is in percent, so you would see something like 100% transmittance, so you would expect this for most things, and then all the way down here would be zero. So this is essentially 40% and 80% right here. So as you can see, most of the wavelengths went all the way through. All this energy went through, all the way through, all the way through, except for this spot right here, we can see that IR energy was absorbed, and then this one right here, which actually has two different pieces to it. There's one right here and one right here, but I wouldn't expect you to be able to see that yet. So let me clean this up a little bit so it's not as messy. So what we wanna do now is look at this and be able to assign our energy or, or our vibrations. So this one right here is the highest in energy, which means this has to be our stretch. So that means that this peak right here is to do with our second diagram that we drew, so that asymmetrical stretch. And then we have this one over here and this one. So this would be three and this would be four. But this whole peak on this, this uh, right side is going to be your lowest in energy and these are definitely going to come from your bend. So picture four and picture three. What I do want you to notice is that picture one is not here. Okay, we do not have any IR absorption because the electron cloud was not distorted. And so it just goes right through that. So that type of stretch does not absorb infrared radiation. So now, here is the entire reason why I'm telling you this. Greenhouse gases absorb IR radiation and heat our planet. So at this point, I fully expect you to understand this. I expect you to be able to draw out that molecule, understand the geometry, understand what happens when the IR radiation hits it, and then move forward from there to understand how it's actually a greenhouse gas. So let's make sure we kind of understand this. Oh, geez. Let's make sure we understand this. The question is, will nitrogen absorb IR radiation? What do you think? Did you get an answer? Hopefully you did, and the correct answer is no. Nitrogen will not absorb infrared radiation. So nitrogen, if you draw it out, is a linear molecule, but it's the exact same atom. So there's no difference in electronegativity. Neither one of the atoms is pulling the electrons, the valence electrons of the other atom towards itself. So this is not going to have a distorted electron cloud. There's no way we could draw the vectors in a way that they would not cancel out. So this would not absorb IR. So now, nitrogen, oxygen, not greenhouse gases, but carbon dioxide definitely is. But our worst offender is actually water. So let's look at the IR spectrum of water. And so on the left side over 
over here. This is just noise, okay? So just ignore that part. We, I, we, it's not worth going into it in this course. But essentially what we see in this water spectrum are two very distinct different peaks. There, so there's one right here, we're gonna call that A, and then there's one right here, B. And so if you look at the top, they definitely split up here, but there's two very distinct peaks. So what I want you to do right now is to identify the stretching. So which one of these is a result of a stretching vibration, not a bending, a stretching. Go. Did you get an answer? Hopefully you did, and the correct answer is A. Here's the thing, you do not really even have to understand this in order to get this question correct. All you have to understand is a stretch requires more energy, and so the stretches are always going to be on the farthest left as possible, and your bends are going to be on the right in terms of these spectrums. You must be able to identify that. Stretch, high energy, bend, low energy. Have a great week. Take care of yourself. Drink water.